Welcome to the weekly live stream. My name is Ryan Pauly, encouraging you and challenging you to think deeper about the Christian faith and preparing you hopefully to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ in the culture that we live in. And what a more difficult topic. I don't think there's a more difficult topic that we need to be prepared to respond to than the problem of evil if we are going to take a stance for Jesus and the goodness of a God in our culture. All right? The questions that often come of why did God allow this to happen? Where was God when these disasters struck? If God is all good, then he would want to stop all evil. And if God is all powerful, then he could stop all evil, but evil still exists. Therefore, God is either not all good, not all powerful, or both. Either way, the Christian God doesn't exist. How do we respond to this? Well, hopefully we can look at the intellectual problem of evil, break down some of the common misconceptions, and you can walk away with a little bit more knowledge and how to think deeper about the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the power of God, but also why he would allow these things to happen in our culture. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I just got done spending two weeks on this topic with my high school students, my doctorate class. And I tell you what, there's nothing that's more encouraging and exciting than walking into the beginning of the lesson, beginning of the chapter, discussing why God would allow evil and having them have maybe a lot of misconceptions, misunderstandings, even be, not even being able to define what evil is. That's going to be a question we're going to look at. And then walking away at the end, actually non-Christian students saying, I get it. The Christian answer actually makes sense of why there's evil in the world. I get why God would allow it. And they they are left more assured and actually more confident in a God that they don't even really believe in, and at least the Christian response to it. Whereas before, no, there's evil. God clearly doesn't exist. And so uh, hopefully sharing some of that, and again, taking questions at the end, if you have uh, personal questions that we can address uh, looking at this difficult issue. Now, as I jump in, I just want to do a quick reminder. Next week, the live stream is not going to be on Thursday night, as I try to usually plan, because next week is an interview. And so here I have it. Dr. Jeff Zwerink is going to be joining the show next week. He's an astrophysicist, a research scientist at UCLA, studying dark matter and gamma rays. That's his expertise. He's also a research scholar at Reasons to Believe. And he's written a book called uh, Escaping the Beginning, and it's responding to challenges against the universe having a beginning uh, and people trying to argue that it's eternal because if it's eternal, then you don't have a beginning. If you don't have a beginning, then you don't have a beginner. And so the modern scientific evidence with the Big Bang cosmology points to beginning, therefore a beginner. That's good evidence for God's existence. And so next Monday, just a few days away, he's going to be coming on at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to discuss the scientific evidence for the beginning of the universe and the Christian implications for that. So if you have any questions when it comes to the Big Bang, Big Bang cosmology, beginning of the universe, or anything kind of like string theories or multiverse theories or whatever that may be, join next Monday and make sure you interact with that conversation there. All righty, so now we're going to be jumping into this issue so we can spend a lot of time looking at why God allows evil. And so really what we have, and what's going on here is that we have this problem of evil. And this creates a problem for a lot of people. And what we first need to start with is asking the question, all right, so what is evil? If you're going to be complaining about the evil that is going on around the world, then we should probably have an idea of what we actually mean by evil. And I think this is a really good place to start because not all worldviews actually grant the existence of evil. When you look at pantheistic worldviews, like an Eastern religion and pantheism, new spirituality, these kind of issue, these kind of worldviews and religions that fall under it, they would claim that the physical universe is an illusion because in pantheism, God is everything, all is God, God is spirit, therefore the physical world is an illusion. It's this, phys- it's this illusion that we're attached to, that we're attracted to, and it's actually that attraction that is creating the suffering that we have in our life. But if the physical world is an illusion as like Buddhism or Hinduism would teach, uh, aspects of that at least. And uh, then physical suffering is also an illusion. It, it's not even real. And so I think that in very short summary, it, the existence of evil actually creates a big problem for pantheistic worldviews that says evil is just simply an illusion. Now, I won't take all the time tonight to discuss this. Maybe I'll do another podcast in the future if a lot of questions come in on it or, or show in the future. But... Um, I think that an atheistic worldview also has a very hard time actually defining evil and making evil something real. 
Because the way that I would define it, and I think that we, the way that we understand is, is good is that which aligns with the original design, right? And you think about this, and I've talked about this, I think, before, of a chair. Well, what's a good use for a chair? Well, what is a chair designed to do? When you know what something is designed to do, then you know what the good use is for it, using it in the way that it was designed to be used. Uh, then you would know what a bad use is, using it in a way it was not designed to be used, right? You could do the same thing with an iPhone or a marker or a pen or whatever. How is the phone designed to be used? Therefore, doing what it was meant and created to do is good, if I want to take my phone and use it as a baseball or a basketball or a football or anything like that, I will destroy it. Using something in a way it was not meant to be used is going to cause probably some harm or destruction to that thing. And so when, I, when we ask the question when it comes to humans, what were we designed and created to do? What are we purposed for? With an atheistic worldview would say, there is no design. There is no purpose. That's a famous Richard Dawkins quote, right? In a world of random genetic mutations, this is my quoting it from memory, in a world of random genetic mutations and blind physical forces, right? At rock bottom, there's no good, no evil, no design, no purpose, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And I think Dawkins is onto something there where he talks about, look, if we're going to be discussing this idea of evil, the problem of evil, then we need to define what evil is. In a world where there's, there's no designed purpose for human beings, a way in which I ought to act then how do I know what is good for me to do? And if there's nothing that's good for me to do because I'm not acting in the way that I was designed to act, then how can there be a corruption of that good? Evil being the absence of good or the corruption, the privation of good. And therefore, good and evil, I think, can be, can be argued that within an atheistic worldview, secular worldview, evil is just the things that we like and, or don't like. Good are the things that we like. And all evil simply becomes subjective. It's based on cultural understanding. It's based on personal relativism, and we have relativized morality. In fact, that's how what a lot of people in our culture believe is that all morality is just relative. That 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 you know, obviously the more controversial things like abortion or 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 um, you know homosexuality or even sex before marriage. Oh, that's just your opinion. Not that it's actually wrong or right. That's just your simply your opinion. Now, we might be able to agree on murder, but some people would even say, yeah, murder, that is wrong because it's illegal or something of that sense. It's simply just culturally decided. Well, if that's what we want to say evil is, then saying God doesn't exist because of evil is like saying God doesn't exist because I don't like something. Right? It's like saying pineapple pizza is so gross, I hate it, therefore God doesn't exist. That just makes no, no sense to me. Now, the atheist might say, well, but Christians, you believe in objective morality and you think God is objectively good. How do you explain that? And that's a great question. And that's what we should answer. So I think just to start the problem of evil, we need to even start. If someone's complaining about how do you believe in a God that is good and that allows evil to take place. The starting place might be like, hey, can you define what you mean by evil? And then we can have this common understanding. If you can't even hold to objective right and wrong, objective evil, then why is this a problem? You don't have a problem just because you don't like something. Now, from the Christian view, obviously, again, as I, as I mentioned, good would be defined as that which aligns with God's original design. Evil would be a privation or the absence of that good. And that's how we define it. And there's two different ways that evil plays itself out in our culture. We have natural evil. This would be our natural disasters, hurricanes, earthquakes, fires, tsunamis, that kind of stuff. And then we have our moral evil. This is all evil caused by moral agents. And so this is what we would understand are the two different types of evil. And then these two types of evil, and hopefully this chart, if you're watching on, 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 uh, on YouTube, if you're listening over podcasts, you have to check out the YouTube for this. But hopefully this chart, this is something I draw on my board always when I cover this with my high school students. And I find that this little flow chart helps them out very well. So by evil, there's two different kinds, natural and moral. And these natural and moral evils, these evils play out in our life in two different ways, creating two different problems of evil. There's the emotional problem and the intellectual problem. And this is a very important distinction that we have to understand if we are going to be addressing this issue in conversations with other people, right? And so if we're talking about this with someone and they say, how could God allow this bad thing to happen? How can God allow bad things to happen to good people? One of the first questions that we should ask is, of all the questions to ask about God, why this one? If their answer is, well, I was watching a movie or something came up or I saw something random on the news and I'm just curious, why would a good God allow this to happen? That's the intellectual problem, right? They're just struggling with it intellectually. However, if they say, well, because my dad just 
got diagnosed with cancer, or my friend just died, or and they announced that this moral evil has now just happened in their own personal life, that is a very different response. That is not given a response. Well, you go, we all have this thing called free will and God's got a greater plan. And so obviously God let your dad die for a reason. It's like, no, don't, don't, don't say that. The moment you find out they're struggling over an emotional problem of evil, the answer, the response is, listen, I'm sorry. How can I be there for you? Right? That's a response to the emotional problem. If you give an emotional response to the intellectual problem, right? They just watch some movie and they're just curious and you go, ah, cry on my shoulder. Let me hug you. Come here. <laughs> that's just going to be weird. That, that's going to be you know, like, what, do, what are you doing? Get off of me. What, what is happening right now? But if you give an intellectual answer to the emotional problem, as I sometimes joke, you'll have your own problem of evil as you maybe get slapped or punched in the face, right? We have to make a distinction here. Now, what I really want to address tonight is I want to show how the intellectual problem and more specifically, the logical version of the intellectual problem is not a good argument. So the intellectual problem can come through in one of two different ways. The logical version says this. Here's my chart. If God is all good, then he would want to eliminate all the evil in the world. If God is all powerful, he could eliminate all the evil in the world. There is evil, that we're certain. So therefore, either God is not all good, not all powerful, or both. Either way, the Christian God doesn't exist, right? This is creating a logical contradiction here. So right in the same way, oh, go back. Oh no, why did that go full screen? Oh, that's weird. All right, make that go away. I don't know what just happened. Can I fix it? There we are. That was strange. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so um, to understand now, when we're going to be talking and discussing this idea, um, what they're trying to say with the logical problem of evil is this, that to say that a good, powerful God exists at the same time as evil is like saying, I am both six foot five and five foot 10 at the same time, or the earth is both a globe, a sphere, and it's flat at the same time. Those are logically inconsistent, incompatible ideas. Therefore, they cannot both be true. And so therefore, because we are so confident that evil does exist and an evil and God cannot logically fit together, therefore, God cannot exist, right? And that is the logical problem of evil. Where the probability problem is slightly different is the probability problem would say, okay, yes, logically, God can coexist with evil. And we'll show why here in just a second. But it's highly unlikely. When you look at all what seems like pointless suffering in the world, it's more likely, it's it's better, it's easier to conclude that there's more like not a God that exists than there is a good and powerful a God. Yes, it's logically possible for that to be true, but it's not very likely, right? That would be the probability argument, or maybe we can discuss that at a different day. So looking at the logical problem of evil, oh, let me bring this back up. The logical problem, as it points out, it looks like this. Now, we can go through and we can discuss these points, uh, but an easy way to look at this and a very easy defense is what's called the free will defense, right? That, that free will is so valuable that God gave us free will, and in, he has to allow us to use it wrongly. In fact, that's as logical as it gets. If you want to talk about logic, for God to give us free will and not allow us to use it wrongly, then that's not free will. That's logical. Now, free will doesn't even have to be true. We don't even have to have free will. But if that's even possible, if it's even possible that an all-good, all-powerful God would allow evil for the purpose of human beings having free will, which is a greater good, a world in which contains free creatures is more valuable than a world with no free creatures, then that destroys right there the logical problem of evil. All that has to be possible is that God allows for free will, and then that is why there's evil and a good God at the same time. And we do no longer have this logical, logically incompatible idea. But there's also a way to look at the argument that's posted here and actually show that this argument is slightly flawed. Now, when I put this up and I talk to uh, students and audiences, I normally ask the question, um, can uh, uh, do, or do you agree with the first two points? If God's all good, then he would want to eliminate all the evil? Yeah, that seems to make sense. And if God's all powerful, he could eliminate all the evil in the world? Yeah, that makes sense too. 
Sometimes I make it a little bit stronger and, and I kind of put it in a situation. Imagine, you know, a father standing by the edge of the pool that has the ability to jump in and save his drowning child and steps back and says, you know, I'm, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to save my child. Would you call that father good if he has the ability to save the child and doesn't? Of course not. We would say that's a horrible dad. That is not a good father. And that's where the person says, yeah, see, God's not all good. If he has the power to stop evil and he doesn't, then he's not good. The other scenario would be like if I'm trying to save someone who's drowning in the ocean, who's maybe way bigger than I am. And I literally cannot save them. Think of like Shaq or something, right? Think of just someone who's, who's a big human being and I'm trying to save him drowning in the ocean and I just literally can't. I have all the right intentions. I want to do it. I'm trying to do it, but I literally can't. Then I would not be all powerful. And so what this argument's trying to say is, look, that's, that's one of God's two ways. Either he's standing by the pool watching this evil, pointless suffering take place and is choosing to do nothing about it. He's not all good. Or he is just powerless to help. He's trying, but he just can't. He doesn't have that strength. Or both. He's just not there. What do you think about it now? And that's where, again, my students maybe, and when I present this, it's like, oh, ah, I don't know. Well, let's think about this for a second. Let's look at point number one. If God is all good, then he would want to eliminate all evil suffering in the world. Do good parents always, forever, eliminate 100% of the suffering in their kids' lives? No. In fact, do you intentionally inflict pain on yourself? Yes, you do. Can you think of any examples? What about giving, getting an injection yourself, a flu shot? You're intentionally inflicting pain on yourself when they shove that needle into your arm. Why do you do that? What about injections with little kids when they're going to get their immunizations? Why would a good parent allow their one-year-old to get immunizations, to, get, to allow the nurse to shove a needle into their arm and leg and give them those injections? Now, unless you're anti-vaccine uh, and you have other reasons for it, this illustration makes sense. Other reasons against it, I should say. This illustration makes sense, right? It's because the parent recognizes that there is a greater good, that there is a better purpose for inflicting this temporary minor suffering in the life of the child. Now, with the one-year-old, does the one-year-old know why this is happening? No, the one-year-old is, maybe even if the parent has to hold the child down so they don't squirm and scream and yell, the one-year-old's looking at the parent saying, you're my parent, you're supposed to be protecting me. Well, the one-year-old wouldn't say that, but you get the point. Uh, you're supposed to be protecting me. Why are you allowing this person to afflict this pain on my life? And the parent, though, goes, you know, you just, you don't understand. One day you will. Right? And we grow up and then we do understand. We understand, yes, that is a temporary minor pain that we go through that ultimately has a greater good to protect us from certain, uh, certain viruses and certain uh, diseases or infections or, or, or sicknesses. And so we go, look, does a good parent always eliminate all evil and suffering in the world? No. Or in their, ch in their child's life? No. You maybe work out which causes soreness in your body. Why? Because that actually makes you healthier. We exercise, which sometimes is a suffering in itself of we struggle and we strain to finish what we're trying to do. And maybe if we work out hard, the next couple of days we're super sore and can barely move. We just intentionally put pain and, and suffering in our lives. Why? Because we're making ourselves healthier. And so I think we can think of plenty of examples, going to the doctor's office, getting a surgery done. We intentionally cut people open inflict so much pain in them that we have to give them all these uh, medications to, to take the pain away. Why? Because ultimately there's a greater good in store. There's a greater purpose in mind. And so I think this first part of this argument fails. We say, if God is all good, then he would want to eliminate all the suffering in the world. I don't think that's true. Even with humans, we recognize we're good. We're not eliminating all suffering because some suffering produces there's a greater good for it. And I would even say that it grows our character, right? Do we learn more when you have easy tasks at hand? Or do you learn more when you've struggled and suffered through something difficult and come through it in the end, right? That grows our character, right? Think of a sports team. If you just win every game by 15, nothing, you don't lose, you don't learn much. 
I was always told playing sports, you sometimes learn the most when you play a great opponent and they pick you apart and they beat you by a lot. And then you can look at ways in which you failed and that helps you grow, right? It's often breaking something down that helps it go stronger in the future. So I think there's many different examples that we can look at to say, yes, there are times where we can inflict suffering or we go through difficulties and that makes us better. And I, I, and I frequently share this. If we've never gone through suffering in our life, then how would we possibly ever understand when God says, Jesus suffered for you? When God says, I forgive you, if I've never had to forgive anyone because no one could ever do anything to hurt me, how can I possibly understand the forgiveness of God? When God says, I will give you peace, what does that even mean if I've never experienced chaos? And it's often these trials, these difficulties that we go through that are producing in us greater character that will help us fully and more completely understand and know God. Because the purpose of life is not happiness, right? The, the, God's goal in life is not just to make us happy and take away all of our suffering. God's goal in life is for us to know him. And it's often suffering that causes us to be drawn to him, that draws us to him, and then allows us to know him more fully. So I think there's good reasons to eliminate here the first part of this logical problem of evil. What about part number two? God is all-powerful. He could eliminate all the evil in the world. Well, how would he do this? Right, and I just had a student just today in the final day. They took their test on, on, uh, on the chapter today, and, and a student asked, okay, so I, couldn't God have given human beings free will and then taken all the evil kind of out of the world and all, there's only good things? My question is, how, how do you do that? Because one thing I teach my students is that there's a difference between potential evil and actual evil. And pretty much everything is a potential evil. It becomes actual evil when that thing is misused. So rocks, rocks are a potential evil. We as free creatures can take that rock and hit someone in the head with it and turn it into an actual evil. But a rock is not inherently evil. It's a potential evil. It could be used wrong. Water, which nourishes the earth, causes floods, and it sustains us and allows us to live, but someone can drown. Gravity, which keeps us in existence, causes people to fall, right? And you can keep going, right? And this is kind of the, the gun debate issue in our culture is guns are a potential evil when used wrongly, and they are used wrongly, and it creates evil, pain, and suffering in people's lives. And so now we are here as a culture and as a country trying to weigh out the good aspects of guns versus the negative aspects of guns and saying, is this potential evil worth it? Or is it not worth it because it's turned into actual evil too much and we should get rid of it, right? And then the, the argument in response is, well, but if you take away guns, well, guess what? There's knives and that's a potential evil. It's a good thing. It helps us cut our steaks and chop up our food and all that kind of stuff. But it is an actual evil when used to kill someone. All right, and we, we ask that question. Again, uh, airplanes allow us to travel the world and explore and, and go places quickly, but they do crash and have been used in terrorist act attacks. Airplanes are potential evil. Should we eliminate airplanes, that potential evil, in order to get rid of that evil? Well, if you say yes, well, what about cars? What about bicycles, right? And the list can go on. In fact, you could walk outside your house today or tomorrow, fall down, trip your knee, uh, trip, scrape your knee. Uh, are you going to stop walking? I don't think so. Right. And so we understand. That. And so my question to the student is, OK, if you're going to say, if, yeah, if God is all powerful, then he could eliminate the evil in the world, that he creates a world that only has good and still free creatures. My question is, how is that possible? What can we think of that has no ability to be a potential evil? Instead, I would say, well, how is it possible in heaven? Because that's the next that's the objection. Well, you think you have free will in heaven? Yes, I do. And how is that going to be possible? Well, because my view is that we have learned about the pain and suffering caused by evil that we will be smarter and will then see the goodness and the glory and the greatness of God to where we will truly appreciate, love God and hate evil. And the common example, and I don't have a pen nearby, but if you have a pen, should I take this pen? Shove it in my eyeball. No, no one wants to see so you take a pen and shove it in your eye. No, I'm never going to do that. I got this example from my professor, Clay Jones. Um, now, I'm never going to take a pen and just shove it in my eye. Why not? 
because that's dumb. That's really stupid. I recognize the value of good eyesight and the pain that it will cause me to stick a pen. I'm never going to do that. And I think that's one possibility of others. We don't have time to get into one possibility of how we will have free will in heaven, but we won't sin. Um, there's, like I said, there's others we can go into about our nature is reborn and renewed, but that's one's possibility of that we will re- truly see and love the goodness and greatness of God and truly recognize the pain and the stupidity of evil that even with the freedom to take a pen and shove it in my eye, I will never do it. Even with the freedom to sin in heaven, we will never do it. We are learning about the stupidity of sin here in this life. So how would God actually do that now without us learning that lesson? And then again, I think that's one reason why God may allow evil in this life is that we suffer because of the sin caused by us and other human beings. And that teaches us valuable lessons that then will help us truly appreciate the goodness of God when we get to heaven. And so I think there's many reasons we can look at of it's logically impossible for God to give us free will and not allow us to use it wrongly. And in a world that he has created, virtually everything is a potential evil that can be used by free beings for wrong. And so we, I I hold to, and most Christians would hold to what is called, you know, the, the greatest of all possible worlds. Right, a maximally great world that God created the greatest possible world, the greatest amount of good, the least amount of evil, given what he truly wants us to recognize and truly wants us to, to be able to experience. Right, and, and know that many of the joys that you experience in life do take have a risk. Right, We enjoy boating and sailing, but you can crash and drown. And we recognize these things and we weigh out these risks every day. But to eliminate all potential evil would also eliminate all all potential good. And that is not a better world. And so I think in a world where God is all powerful, he not, he couldn't eliminate all the real real evil in the world because then he would be taking away our free will, taking away all the potential evil. And then there is no really world for us to even live in. So this argument then, the logical version of the problem of evil, I think falls apart when you look at these aspects. And so No, it's not logically impossible for God and evil to exist. Now, then that leaves the probability version. And maybe you can write in the comments if you really want uh, 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 a video on this soon. Maybe uh, after the interviews I have lined up, uh, discuss this. But this is now, I think, the better argument. And if you're not a Christian, you're like, no, I still want to argue against the existence of God using the problem of evil. Use the probability probability version. I'll show that you've really looked into this issue. And that's saying, look, okay, yes, because of the way that God has designed things, because of God, potential evil, because of free will, it's not logically impossible for God and evil to exist, but it seems like pointless suffering and it's highly unlikely. There are responses. We just don't have the time to get into them tonight. So hopefully this helped you. And uh, not too many comments came in. And so I'll stick around for just a little bit longer to see if any other comments uh, or questions come in on evil, pain, suffering, the logical, uh, intellectual problem of evil. But hopefully this helped you as uh, we looked at this very common argument. You see this all the time. It mainly shows up kind of on the the kind of the internet atheist uh, on the chat rooms. Uh, most scholarly atheists, I, I don't hear this argument coming from a lot of them. They recognize it's a failed argument. Uh, it has been destroyed by the free will defense. Uh, and so the better one is going to be the probability version. So hopefully that has uh, been helpful to you as you are dealing with people bringing up this objection to you in the future. Again, trying to prepare you to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ, to faithfully represent Jesus to the culture and this being one of those difficult issues. So if you like this video, subscribe below, hit the bell to be notified. Again, on Monday is going to be my interview with Dr. Jeff Zwerink discussing the Big Bang cosmology, the beginning of the universe, and how that points to a creator. Don't miss that. Monday, 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Other interviews, other live streams coming up, other question of the day videos coming out. Subscribe also on Instagram and Twitter to interact with different posts that are being posted, ask questions for interview guests, and uh, stay up to date on all things happening with the ministry. So with that, I'm going to sign off. Have an awesome rest of your week, a great weekend. Um, I pray that God blesses you. Thank you for all that you're doing. Check out all the other resources in the links below on the website. Thank you guys. See you later.